All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. We couldn't be more excited to be hosting events during Secret Path uh, Week in partnership with the Gore Downey and Channing Wenjack Fund. The Downey Wenjack Fund is part of musician Gore Downey's legacy and embodies his commitment and that of both the Downey and Wenjack families to call Canadians to action in solidarity with Indigenous peoples of this land. So the goal is to continue continue the conversation that began with Chani Wenjack's residential school story and to support the reconciliation process through awareness, education, and action. So we spent Thursday and Friday connecting with classrooms across Canada and talking with Indigenous scientists, artists, and leaders from across the country as we work towards meaningful reconciliation. And we're going to continue that today and tomorrow as well. So we're really excited today to be joined by uh, Michael Vey also known as Kanistisla. He is a Heltzik environmental steward. He works at the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance, where he provides technical support for the Marine Planning Partnership, as well as Indigenous laws coordination. So Michael's passionate about working towards greater Indigenous-led management, especially in the form of Indigenous protected areas. And he truly believes that Indigenous philosophies and ways of knowing are of the utmost importance for finding ways for more sustainable, uh, practices in this era of climate change. So Michael, it's so great to have you joining us today. We've got classrooms joining us from across Canada. We have even more tuning in via YouTube and we're excited to get to know you a little better. Hi everyone. Thanks Joe for having me. All right. Awesome. So Michael, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. I know you have uh, some uh, things you'd like to share with us today and when you're ready, we'll start uh, talking to our classrooms as well. Okay. Yeow, suk snukus yech gaios, canistis la canuqua, heis la canuqua. Hello, everybody. I'm very thankful that we could all get together this morning and be here. My name, as Joe said, is canistis la, and I'm a part of the Heltzik Nation. I am um, well, on the topic of, uh, of uh, residential schools. My uh, grandmother personally was a residential school survivor, and um, that intergenerational trauma certainly did. Uh, carry forward uh, to my own parents and uh, somewhat through through me. But I had a very, for, uh, fortunately, a very different experience uh, with institutionalized schooling um, and was a part of, uh, of uh, Simon Fraser University's resource environmental management uh, program uh, when I went and did my undergraduate degree. But truth be told, I wasn't actually that great of a student um, even to start. Uh, I got into the school and I, and I started by caring about playing football there more than I cared about actually going to school. But uh, the more that I took the time to actually learn about uh, my own history, First Nations people's history in Canada, and uh, understood what it meant for me to take my schooling home and work with my own nation, the more I, I understood how important it was to, to take it seriously and, and also just having the opportunity to go into a place where I was allowed to explore what made me passionate rather than just being uh, told what I was supposed to learn and was going to learn. So, um, you know, my, my family was not a, uh, not a studious family. Uh, I didn't come from a back, I didn't come from a background of, of parents who went to university, didn't come from a background of parents who even finished high school. And, um, you know, it, it really was a very new avenue for, for me uh, and my and my whole family to, to go down that road. But now that I've been able to, I've been one year out of school now, uh, it took me five years to get my undergraduate degree, but um, I've been very fortunate um, to be a part of the health Nation and also be um, welcomed into the community, not just as a family member, but as a professional and being able to work directly with my own nation uh, at the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance where I work on, as Joe said, uh, the Marine Planning Partnership, which is a uh, government and nation-led uh, organization that works on everything from fisheries, forestry, renewable energy, uh, aquaculture, and sets out all of these sort of objectives and mutual understandings in this one singular document that has an idealized scenario. And so the provincial government of BC and First Nations all up and down the coast work together to, to make that project happen. And so at the central coast level, 
The Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance represents Mayo Nation, the Celtic Nation, as well as Wicano Nation, Kittisu Nation, and Newhawk Nation. And so I get to work um, not only with Mayo Nation, but the three other neighboring nations around us as well to make sure that, that plan uh, is put into place. I've also taken on a newer role um, with Indigenous Laws Coordination, where I'm working with each one of these nations to uh, identify their Indigenous laws, uh, either, either written explicitly uh, or being interpreted through uh, oral history and oral storytelling and creating a, a general framework that works at, the, at that regional level of, of the central coast of BC and creating a, a document that's a guiding framework for any sort of conservation uh, zoning or, or legislation that's gonna come, be coming up in the future uh, with a specific application to the creation of indigenous protected areas on the central coast. And so that's me in a nutshell. That's been uh, my whole 24 years of my life. Um, I've really been able to make the most out of, of uh, not only going and furthering my education, but going out into the world and then bringing it back to, to the people that I, I really do care about. So I, I think that uh, there's probably a lot, a lot of uh, youth in, in these classrooms right now that are wondering whether or not uh, they wanna continue their education um, or if, if they're thinking of a way, like how can I support my own community? Um, me, when I was going down that road and, and starting, it was not a clear picture. I was just going to school and doing it, but you know, I figured it out um, as I went along and, and I, I feel very fortunate. And so I'm, I'm just trying to share that story with, uh, with all of you young fine people today. All right. Well, Michael, I have a few questions uh, about the Indigenous protected areas. So um, is this something that has already started to happen in British Columbia? Are there some areas that are under Indigenous protection or is this something that we're still working towards? No, there is absolutely pre-existing uh, Indigenous protected and conservation areas. Um, so there's uh, the Mears Tribal Island Park um, down close to Tofino. There's the Daifto uh, Tribal Protected Area up in the northeastern part of BC. And then probably most famously, there's a Guayanas uh, uh, Federal uh, Park out in uh, close to Haida Gwaii, which is um, recognized both as a as a parks, uh, Canada parks, and also recognized as a indigenous protected area, um, depending on who you're talking to. So these definitely are pre-existing uh, areas and zones and, and policies that are being put in place. But was, as far as our region on the central coast, nothing like that quite exists formally. Um, so we're looking to formalize that process and, uh, and build up those IPAs on the coast of BC. All right, very cool. So does your work take you out into the field often? And if so, uh, what do you get to do when you're out in the field out in these beautiful areas? Yeah, this, this line of work um, brings me into communities and I, and I get to go and see these communities and, and meet with family members and, and other, other people up and down the coast um, and go out into the field and, and sometimes look at areas, um, but more so in, in previous work um, when I worked with Hakai Institute and my nation's own uh, resource management department uh, did I get to go and hop on a boat, uh, either grab a drone or get a 110 liter bag full of, of gear and, and hike it up a mountain or uh, you know, work at a salmon weir um, or, or bushwhack for a kilometer um, in that line of work. And, and all, all those were, were, were different positions that I've held in over the previous summers as internships as a student. Um, but they were they were super important for me to understand even what I'm what I'm talking about at this point because I think there's something to be said about going out into the field and learning firsthand about what it takes to get that information so that when you become somebody who is in a decision making or any sort of resource management you're understanding just how much work it takes to get information on what you're talking about. All right, and so it looks like Mrs. Paz's class was able to join us via camera. Give us a wave, you can hear us okay. All right, perfect, so that's our group in Winnipeg. So we'll be able to get the questions right from them. We don't have to uh, watch for the YouTube. All right, perfect. So Michael, I'm curious about, um, you know, as you mentioned, the area where you're working in right now doesn't have um, the Central Coastal Indigenous Resource, or, or the Central Coastal Area doesn't have those protected areas yet. 
are you finding that you're running into you know, any roadblocks or challenges that you have to overcome? Um, nothing insurmountable, um, I don't think. I think there's a lot of, um, on most scales, there's a lot of uh, will to create these protected areas. Um, on, a, on a national scale, it's a part of our um, biodiversity targets and, and a part of our uh, protecting a certain percentage coverage of uh, Canada for conservation. It's on the international, and that, that mandate is, is somewhat coming from the international Aichi targets that are uh, headed by um, the United Nations. And then also at the nation level, there's been an appetite to have uh, protected areas that don't push out indigenous communities and are created with, uh, with zoning and, and allowed activities that do uh, accommodate certain na uh, nation practices like hunting and medicine gathering and bringing youth out onto the land and so that you don't have a, a total erasure of the, of the communities that were, were already there by creating uh, conservation areas that don't include them. So there is a many different scales. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of appetite for this, um, but some of the more uh, formal processes like creating legislation that's represented uh, at the provincial level, um, having a uh, parallel recognition from the provincial government and the federal government um, on the recognition of your IPA and having their having their legislation and, and their uh, knowledge bodies and frameworks represent what you want to have represented in your in your indigenous protected area, which is in of itself separate. Because I think it's just it's important to remember that a provincial government and a federal government can't create an indigenous protected area. Indigenous communities and nations have to make indigenous protected areas. So you need to you need to always find a way, and this has been done in Guayanas, where you have the federal and provincial legislation representing the same activities and zoning that's in a protection area, but the actual authority and autonomy and living being that is an indigenous protected area is held within the communities themselves. All right. Well, one last question before we start meeting our classrooms, and you brought up biodiversity and how there's biodiversity targets that we're trying to reach here in Canada. Can you tell us a little bit about the biodiversity in the Central Coast? Uh, I'm gonna need another couple of hours to do that one. Uh, but uh, the, the, um, the Central Coast uh, to me is, is just the most beautiful place on earth. And um, it's more biodense uh, than the Amazon rainforest itself. So although there's a lot more diversity and a lot more different species in the Amazon rainforest, if you pick up a cubic meter of soil um, in the Great Barrier Rainforest, you'll find more in there than you would in the Amazon rainforest. So this it's just, it's teeming with a lot of life. And uh, one of the best indicators for that is, uh, is the uh, lichens that grow off of the trees and the length of, length of them. So if you guys are ever out um, in a forest, uh, particularly on the central coast, and you notice the length uh, of, a, of, a, of a lichen or a moss on a tree um, that's hanging off a branch is shorter or longer, you'll know that uh, you're in a older forest if it's, if it's longer. And so um, some of those species are, are very, it's, 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 an, it's more obvious uh, a way of, of understanding just how old this area is. Um, but it's also just this, this beautiful ecosystem where you have these ocean roaming salmon who come back into their, to their home rivers uh, and they provide a food source for everything from eagles to wolves to bears. And to be able to see these, uh, these ecosystems play out and actually be physically see a part of the, of the feasting that takes place in these systems is something that really makes it come alive. It becomes a lot more than just, just an area. It becomes a, you can see it as a living being. And, and you also get to see these communities that aren't just living in these areas, but they're, they're integrated and, and uh, integral to these ecosystems as well. All right. Awesome, Michael. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think we always think about the tropics and the rainforest as such biodiverse area, and they absolutely are. But here in Canada, we're pretty lucky too. And the, the Great Bear Rainforest is a phenomenal example of that biodiversity. All right. Well, uh, I want to give a shout out to the classrooms who are tuning in via YouTube. Don't forget, there's a chat sidebar on the right. Um, you can get in on the action. Let us know where you're watching from and send us in some questions. I'll keep an eye out for them. 
And then whether you're on camera with us or you are on YouTube, take some pictures, uh, share them to Twitter, hashtag Secret Path Week, tag at Downey Wenjack. And then I believe, Michael, you're on Twitter as well at uh, Kinesla as well. So um, you can tag everybody in there and then we can see our classrooms in action. All right, let's meet some of those classrooms. So we're going to start off. We are going to go to Yellowknife uh in the northwest territories we have looks like some grade sevens hanging out with us let's get that microphone turned on where is it uh, there how are we doing grade sevens uh oh that didn't work let's try that again try that here again for us it says the microphone's on hmm uh Let's see, Mrs. Townsend, do you want to try and turn the microphone on and off? It says it's on on my side, but we don't hear you guys. That sounds better. How's it going, grade sevens? How's it going, guys? Good. <laughs> yeah, all right. Who's up with a question? Um. How do you plan on collecting indigenous knowledge to save our planet? I think that's a very good question. And then that goes to the central piece that Joe was talking about, about how I think that indigenous knowledge is a central framework for viewing the world and, and, and realigning our relationship with it. Because you guys are growing up in a climate change era, you understand that our pre existing relationships with the natural world aren't working and they're not sustainable. We have many communities up and down the coast that uh, through many different examples were able to take more uh, than they did consistently throughout their entire existence. So a couple of good examples is uh, a salmon weir, um, which is a barricade uh, made of, of uh, cedar planks and supported by tripods uh, placed in a river when salmon are coming to spawn. And families would traditionally set up this barricade across the entire river um, and use cedar nets to come up behind it and harvest fish uh, for their whole families and communities. This is, this is, a, this is a, a time when salmon are returning to the river and are going to spawn. So it's very easy to take more fish out of the river so that they don't make it up to the spawning grounds and that their escapement uh, or, their, or the amount of fish that are able to continue to spawn so that the next generation can grow uh, to, to exceed that, to, to take more from that than you need to. Um, but these, these, uh, these, these fisheries, uh, these indigenous fisheries uh, were consistent. Uh, they were hardly ever uh, over, over harvested. Um, and it was only ever taken to the point where you needed enough to get you through the winters. And this isn't for a lack of technology. Uh, this isn't even a, a lack of being able to store fish because they could be smoked um, and then preserved for quite a long time. This is simply just uh, understanding that you should not be taking more than you need and that you need to save uh, these important uh, species and, and, and relations uh, for future generations. So another, another good example is that, of that is um, is uh, rockfish hooks, um, which were specially designed uh, fish hooks that were dropped down uh, on the end of cedar rope uh, to a certain depth in the water. Uh, and then once the fish was caught, you pull it up just like any other, any other fishing trip. But the, um, there was a, a, a good understanding um, through indigenous communities that if you go to the, the bottom depth, you'll get to uh, some of the bigger fish, some of the older fish, uh, those older rockfish. And if you go up top, it'll, it'll be a little bit smaller and somewhere in the middle is, is more average size fish. The rock, rockfish have this very unique life cycle where they live for hundreds of years. And they have this, this, uh, this curve of, of birth where the, more, the older they get, the more uh, fish they have. And so you want to leave those older fish so that they can have those more children throughout their entire lifespan so that they're, so that again, that, that relation can be there for future generations. It was easier to just drop your hook down and hit the bottom floor and then pull it up a little bit 
and snag those big fish and get more fish and, and get more out of a singular uh, attempt than, uh, or catch per unit effort than you would if you just tried to suspend it in the middle. But there was an understanding that if you take those fish, you will drop the species uh, uh, population and then there won't be anything for future generations. And so again, that's not a lack of technology. That's not a lack of uh, ability to, to preserve and store and stockhold um, these species. It was just an understanding that you should not be taking that much. And so that understanding and, and that uh, framework of knowing that we have the technology to do certain things and knowing that we shouldn't be taking more than we need to to leave uh, our relations and leave a healthy world for future generations is the overarching uh, idea and paradigm that I want to have ubiquitous in many different environmental policies. And, and it is indigenous communities that hold that knowledge. Those are just two examples, um, but those, those are shared in stories. Those are shared in practice. Those are shared in indigenous communities across the globe. And so it's a responsibility now with the federal governments, provincial governments, international governments that are in these positions of power that are deciding what our future will look like to incorporate perspectives like that so that they can uh, leave a healthy world for future generations. All right, great question and such a good point, Michael. We too often, especially living in our cities, forget that we are actually part of nature and how important it is for us. We're not above it, that you know, we, we, we need to know our place and we need to be protectors, uh, stewards even, I think is the better word. So um, great question to start us off our group in the Northwest Territories. Let us take a swing now. Let's go to Courtney, British Columbia. We've got uh, two classes, Mrs. Foreign's class and Mr. Pattison's class hanging out with us. Let me get their microphone turned on. Oh, Ms. Foreign, it's uh, not cooperating. If you don't mind turning it on for us and then give us a big cheer so we know you're ready. All right, how's it going everyone? We're ready for a question. What causes this to happen? Marine planning Marine planning partnership. Central Coast Indigenous Resource. So what? So how did the Marine Planning Partnership, the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance, why did that start? How did it start? What was what was the impetus for that? Good question. Um, it started off um, as a desire to build on the momentum of the uh, Great Bear Rainforest Agreement, I do believe. Um, I'm not so aware of the history of, of the impetus for starting it, but what I do know is that um, the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement did spur some of those conversations. I think it was just a, a general recognition though that there was a lot of similar activities happening up and down the coast of BC um, with nations having very similar priorities um, and the provincial government likely having very similar conversations uh, in regions where they were having to duplicate their efforts and nations were also not aware of what other nations were doing right, right next door. And so it was kind of just a natural next step once these nations um, had fought for years to take back um, some of their rightful places as, as self-governance owners of their territories um, and redefine their relationship with the, with the local provincial government. And so with that came, came the, uh, the requirement of creating a, um, something called the Marine Planning Partnership, which was uh, serve as a body to organize all the nations uh, to one larger area with, with common activities and desires, and then break it down into subregions where nations could actually work together and, um, and just the, the understanding that the provincial government is, is having similar conversations uh, with these nations and, and there just needs to be a bit more of an organized effort. Um, so that took place, um, I guess, 12 years ago now. Um, so well before my time. Um, so I would have been uh, 12 when, when, this, when this started and it's been a, been a long time coming, but there is now uh, four separate subregions. There's Haida Gwaii, North Coast, Central Coast and Northern Vancouver Island. And um, 
I can tell you that in the short period that I've been working here, uh, it's very constructive. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, collaborative effort, um, which you can sometimes not get when you're working with, uh, with other government bodies. Um, so it's, it's quite a refreshing place to be at the early point in my career um, and, and seeing how uh, all these different governments want to work together. All right, very cool. Great question from our class in Courtney. Let's see, let's go to Winnipeg this time. So Mrs. Paz's group, four fives are joining us in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Let's get their microphone switched on. How are we doing, Winnipeg? All right, nice to hear you. Who's up with the question? So there's going to be a little feedback just because there's the two things on in your room. So let's grab the question and I can put you back on mute. How is the reason this is different from government when working on COVID Oh, dear. Yeah. Sounds like a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Can you try to repeat that for us, Mrs. Paz? I, I, I can try. So the question that they're asking is how is Indigenous perspective different from government procedures when working on conservation? Perfect. This is a very, very good question. Um, and I think they're, they're very different in their understanding of uh, the relationship to these ecosystems and people's place within it. Um, historically, conservation areas have been, uh, you know, a couple of people sitting in a boardroom, uh, striking up an area and saying, okay, this is uh, for wildlife. Uh, nobody can go in there and nobody can take anything from there. And uh, we're just gonna leave it alone. And um, that has just not been the relationship that indigenous peoples have had with uh, their landscapes. I can tell you firsthand after working in, in my, uh, my own territory that the cultivation of particular species and, and coming across massive beds of uh, uh, hellebore, which is a plant for medicine, um, were just in, based on, their, on their, their location in the ecosystem and the, uh, the available nutrients to them, that, that that particular patch would not have gotten that large without the assistance and cultivation of people being a part of that ecosystem. And so there is something wrong with, with having a, a people be a part of an ecosystem so integrally for hundreds and thousands of years um, to all of a sudden in the last 200 years, pull them completely out of it. And so the, the relationship with areas and the relationship with space that indigenous people have is one that is reciprocal with the with the ecosystems, and it's been demonstrated that the people are a requirement of the current uh, uh, steady state of the ecosystem uh, in order to in order to maintain uh, the health of those ecosystems. And so, I guess the the main difference is is that um, the old frameworks for conservation areas uh, is that they want people to stay out. Uh, indigenous protected areas want to use these areas to continue these, these practices of cultivation, continue these practices of knowledge transfer to future generations and ensure that uh, they can still go out and practice their, their culture on, in their land while also ensuring that uh, what they take uh, is sustainable and, and going off of, off of practices that they've known for since time immemorial, but also using uh, science to understand how different phenomena like climate change are, are impacting their ability to go and harvest. And so I would say the main difference between indigenous protected area and other conservation areas is that they're trying to get people back on the land and they're trying to get people back uh, to uh, having a more uh, sustainable relationship with these conservation areas. All right, we're gonna jump back to the coast. We're gonna go to Kelowna, British Columbia this time. We have uh, some secondary students hanging out with us. Let's see if I can get their microphone turned on. Awesome. How are we doing, Kelowna? Good. All right, who's got a question? <laughs> How could we use indigenous knowledge to help the ever-growing global population? Uh, 
I, I don't know if um, with help with helping the ever growing population. Um, what is it you mean by that? You mean globally or maybe more locally in British Columbia? Oh, thank you, sir. More locally, urban. Urban. Yeah. What's your favorite urban. type of fish? No. Okay, so it sounds like uh, maybe they're thinking, uh, Michael, about finding kind of that balance between a population in British Columbia that's obviously growing and becoming more urban. Um, and then kind of find that balance between sustainability and nature. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think there are definitely some some principles that can be pulled from indigenous communities on just general balance of, of one population to another. Um, but it, uh, it would likely generally be just um, going into these indigenous communities that are local to you. And if you're talking about a local population, um, I think it's best to go to those nations that are around you and understand how they would like the non-Indigenous communities to exist in their territories and get an understanding of, of their practices of the landscape and be a, uh, a good ally in their, in their uh, own territory. And so if it's a local population, I think you, you should take it upon yourself to go and speak with the local Indigenous communities uh, in whose territory that you reside uh, on a more national level uh, population issue. Um, there is a, a general understanding that more people means more resource use and more resource use, if not done correctly, uh, can be more unsustainable, but that it, it isn't that linear of an equation. Um, and these uh, indigenous communities have been supported um, by ecosystems with communities of tens of thousands, and certainly they've grown um, from smaller groups uh, to the past in the past um, to bigger groups, and also have traveled in different areas um, with different ecosystems with different limits, and had to understand how their large population all of a sudden coming into an area could live in there sustainably. And so I think that's that's um, at a local level it's more nuanced, and you need to go and speak to these communities themselves. Um, but there is certainly lessons learned about moving into another area and understanding uh, the, the ecosystems over time to get to a place where you can try to achieve sustainability. All right, let's take a quick scan down the list. We're gonna go to Alberta this time. Uh, Mrs. Burns group is hanging out with us. Let's get their microphone turned on. There they are. How are we doing, Alberta? <laughs> All right, awesome. Who's got a question for Michael? We have Kevin asking a question. Do you hunt or fish? And how does that affect biodiversity? I certainly do fish. Going and hunting mountain goat uh, in November. And um, I think that there is a, a genuine need for people to continue to hunt and fish and be a part of these ecosystems. It's a question of uh, understanding the population levels and knowing when to let these populations rest and, and get back to a point where they're willing to give to you again. Um, this, is a, this is gonna be a much more complex problem uh, as we continue to go down a climate change era where we have these uh, components like habitat shrinking uh, with mountain goats and snowpack decreasing to the point where these populations are dwindling without human use. And so that margin of actually being a part of it and being able to go and actively practice uh, hunting and fishing is going to become a much more smaller gap uh, if there is one at all. So that, that, that's an important uh, piece to understand and it's important to go and get that data and understand where these populations are at but it's also important to fight for policies that allow for these communities to thrive so creating conservation areas uh, supporting scientists going in and understanding population dynamics in these areas um, harvesting at a rate that allows for the replenishment of these communities 
so that you're not taking more than these than these populations can uh, can withstand. So, if if I am in a, in a firm position and I believe um, that the populations are are not doing great, uh, I will withhold um, from going out and fishing. So for this year, for example, I did um, only one salmon fishing trip, um, and it was not by trawl. It was by a singular singular haul. I got uh, a few fish. Um, and I, I heard and understood that the populations were doing uh, quite not well this year and they continue to not be doing very well. Um, so it may be a consideration for me not to go out at all next year. So that's, that's a, but that's a very uh, scary thought to me for, for thinking about my children um, when they come into this world, um, that if I, if I have to tell them that salmon were a thing that I once did and that they cannot do. Um, and, and I want to be able to instill them uh, the, the experience of going and hunting and fishing. And with that, the desire to protect those species that comes with that. Um, so it's, it's really important to, to understand where biodiversity is at before you go out and hunt and fish um, and respect those boundaries when you do. All right. So Michael, I think we have time to squeeze in one or two more questions. So. Uh, classrooms, uh, give me a wave if you have a burning question. We need to come back uh, and visit your classroom. So let's see. Well, I see lots of waving in our Kelowna group. So let's get their microphone turned back on. There it is. All right, we're ready. Have you been treated differently because you are an Indigenous ecologist? Absolutely. Um, it, positive ways and negative ways. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of people that want to um, understand this perspective. Um, and there's, a, and there's a, a, also a lot of people that um, think that it's, uh, it's disingenuous, that it's not a real science. Um, and, there, and there's a, a hard nose uh, opinion that science is science and, and that's, that's all it is. Um, but yeah, there, there is, there is a, there's prejudice absolutely uh, in this line of work and I think everywhere. Um, but that doesn't mean that what we do um, isn't worth doing. And uh, despite some of the hardships that come with being a part of a, of a, of a certain group um, and being opposed to a, a majority of, of thinking uh, in this field, which for a long time was that ecology is ecology, it's just science. There is no personal stake in it um, and that's it. And so when you try to break that framework and make them understand, scientists understand that no, every person has a bias and you have subconscious biases that do make it in to your decisions and do aren't are actually aware uh, and are conscious biases when your research gets applied to management or, or policy that it's worth considering what the frameworks behind this data, behind these management uh, decisions are, what, they, what those uh, frameworks are. And so it's not just understanding an indigenous framework, but it's understanding a colonial framework, it's understanding a Western framework, and it's understanding where all those biases are in order to get to a point where we can be making really informed decisions on resource management. Um, but going down that road, uh, can sometimes be difficult and, and, and you can face prejudice. Um, but, you know, it's, it's um, I find that in this line of work, there's a lot more positives uh, than negatives and that really uh, makes it all worthwhile. All right, great question. And let's squeeze one more class in. Let's go uh, Mrs. Foran's group. I'm gonna turn your microphone on. Who's up? We're ready for you. Who's asking the question? Go ahead. What inspired you to do this? All right, did you catch that, Michael? They're wondering what inspired you to pursue this line of work. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I would attribute it to my elders and, and my mother. I grew up down in a town called Maple Ridge. Um, and when I was younger, my mom would take me and my whole family up um, over to Victoria, drive up Port Hardy, take the overnight ferry to Bella Bella, 
and go and visit family and be a part of these communities. Uh, and when I got there, um, I heard a little bit about some of the values that I told you, you know, leave enough for future generations, uh, ensure that you don't take too much uh, and respect your relations, uh, especially your, your non-human ones. And so that was um, a cons consistent uh, principle that was instilled in my life. And then when I got to school, um, I actually started off, uh, I mean, again, as I said, I wasn't a, a star student. I liked playing sports more than anything else. Um, and then I started off in health sciences. Um, but then I, I, we took a class and I saw um, some of the environmental hazards that were, that were taking place and understood that, you know, that's probably somewhere where I can make more of a difference and have a bigger impact um, as, I, as my understanding of the world in its current state and its relationship to, to, the, to the natural world um, grew. So with, with the foundation that I was born with through my elders and, and my mother, um, along with the ability to go and choose what I want to learn when I got to post-secondary, it really just thrusted me into this position of, of bringing, bringing Indigenous uh, knowledge to the Central Coast of BC and also just bringing my uh, stewardship knowledge uh, back home. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to our classrooms, both joining us on YouTube and live on camera today. Thanks so much for hanging out and the awesome questions. And then Michael, thanks for taking some time today, sharing your story and, you know, just the awesome conservation work that you're doing um, on the coast. And I'm excited to see how things go uh, with the Indigenous uh, protected areas in the Central Coast region. Thanks, Joe. Um, based on all your super good questions, I know that the future is in good hands with kids like you, so I got no worries over here. All right, perfect. Well, the last thing we'll do before we sign off today is I'm going to unmute all the microphones to boys and girls, get a little loud, big goodbye and thank you before we sign off today. Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. You guys are always so good at that. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. We've got two more events today, uh, back to back. One coming up at one with Phyllis Webstad, uh, who founded Orange Shirt Day. And then right from there, we go to uh, Meyer Greenfield from the Rumi Initiative at 2 p.m. Eastern. So I hope I see some of your classes tuning in via YouTube. Again, Michael, thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.